General questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions and we start question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister is in every paper today for spending her time on social media defending her independence blueprint from attacks by her own supporters. This is in a week where we've seen rising waiting lists in hospitals, we've seen fewer young people from deprived backgrounds going to university, and we've seen violent crime on the increase. Does she wonder why the people of Scotland question her priorities? First Minister. Well, firstly, we're seeing an increase in young people from our most deprived communities going to university. Uh, that's very clear from the most recent UCAS uh, statistics. It's also the case that despite the significant challenges uh, faced by our National Health Service, our National Health Service is performing brilliantly. Those actually are the words used by Ruth Davidson just two days ago. But if, if Ruth Davidson wants me to give some highlights from, what is it she calls it, the day job, I would be absolutely delighted to indulge her. So let me just take her through the last 24 hours or so uh, that I've been engaged in. I've announced Scottish Government investment of £5 million in a new subsea engineering centre of excellence in Montrose. I've set out the next steps in the creation of the new National Manufacturing Institute. I've had separate discussions with three major inward investors to Scotland in areas of energy, tourism and low carbon technology. Let's widen it out to the government overall. We've extended the scheme to tackle period poverty with half a million pounds of investment. We've announced an end to child burial fees. We've led the way in action to tackle plastic use. We've passed a new islands bill. We've confirmed funding for the Stirling Click Manager growth deal. Actually, with more money than the UK government is putting into it. Oh. Or maybe Ruth Davidson would like to hear something about the last 10 days or so. We've announced additional investment in Clyde Gateway to create new jobs. We've announced a new £100 minimum school clothing grant, which will help 120,000 families across the country. We've announced an additional £50 million to tackle waiting times. We've published the NHS Safe Staffing Bill, published the new Climate Change Bill, announced £7 million investment in projects to help fishing fleets and coastal communities. We've announced a new £7.5 million innovation fund for new approaches to tackling child poverty. Would you like me to go on? Or is that <laughs> enough for you? So, presenting officer... I'm not sure what Ruth Davidson's been doing for the last few days, but that's what the Scottish Government has been doing. Ruth Davidson. And yet, presiding officer, as far as the country can see, the only result of the last 10 days' activity, restarting the independence debate. Restarting the independence debate is that she's had to firefight against her own supporters who are fighting amongst themselves, which I'm not sure is what she intended. And the truth is we have a First Minister whose prime concern seems to be appeasing her own independence army rather than governing Scotland. They don't like it, but it's true. Now, we already know, presiding officer, we already know that we've had some of the worst NHS waiting times ever. We already know that access to education is being restricted. So let me ask her, let me ask her about another area of responsibility which deserves her attention too. On a scale of 1 to 10, how satisfied does she think rural Scotland is with the actions her government has taken? First Minister. Well, firstly, what the country can see are all the initiatives I've just outlined in this chamber. And the question for Ruth Davidson, I guess, is this. If she doesn't want us to be talking about independence, why is she using her weekly opportunity at First Minister's questions to raise the topic of independence? Isn't it the case, isn't it the case, presiding officer, that Ruth Davidson loves nothing more than talking about the Constitution because she's got nothing else to talk about. She just doesn't want the positive case for independence to be heard. Now, 
Ruth Davidson asked me about rural uh, communities. Now, I hope she was listening to the long list of initiatives that I outlined. She would have heard one of the things uh, I talked about was the £7 million investment in projects to help fishing fleets and coastal communities. Uh, we're working hard to ensure delivery of cap payments, having already uh, made loans uh, to most farmers. Uh, and we will continue to deliver for rural communities Island across Scotland. Uh, yesterday in this chamber, we passed the Islands Bill, helping our island communities. So we will continue to deliver for rural communities, urban communities and all communities across Scotland. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister just mentioned cap payments. That was bold. Let me tell her what farmers are saying. Jim Walker, the former head of the NFUS, made his feelings clear yesterday. Now, they might not want to hear what Jim oh, Walker wait, wait, has one to second, say, one second, but I think Ms. the Chamber should listen. One second, Ms Davidson. Please, there's too much noise in the Chamber today. Can please, let's hear the questions and the answers. Ruth Davidson. Yeah. Let's listen to what Jim Walker has to say, shall we? Three years on from this government's botched farm payment system, Nearly a half of Scotland's farmers are still waiting to be paid what they're owed. Mr Walker says this is a national scandal of epic proportions and taxpayers in Scotland are footing an ever-increasing bill. He says the First Minister is presiding over the biggest funding scandal in modern Scottish history. Perhaps, rather than pulling us all back to theoretical debates about what currency the country might use, Shouldn't the First Minister concentrate a bit more on paying Scotland's farmers the actual currency that they're owed? First Minister. Well, let's just run through some of the fact. We've made basic payment scheme loan payments to 13,577 businesses. That's worth over £314 million. And these loan payments were made before the cap payment window even opened on the 1st of December last year. Uh, nearly 75% of farmers have received 90% of the support they're entitled to under the basic payment scheme. Uh, in terms of the actual basic payment uh, payments, we've paid £217 million uh, pounds with 63% of businesses now paid. And of course, we're working hard to meet the target uh, by the end of June uh, this year. But perhaps the most pressing question facing farmers, not just in Scotland, but right across the UK. And given that her UK government colleagues cannot answer it, perhaps Ruth Davidson can answer it today. Uh, what is going to happen to cap payments after the Tories drag us out of the European Union? Ruth Davidson. They've been guaranteed, but let me tell her what Jim Walker is saying. Let me answer her directly with this. Enough is enough. Let's call a halt to this pantomime. Why should suppliers and farmers bankroll a sector amongst ourselves while our own government sits on our money? This is the responsibility of the First Minister, who is ultimately responsible for the proper use of public funds on our behalf. And it's not just Scotland's farmers that are being let down. Here's the reality of this government's record. This week alone, we have learned that 17,000 people in just a single month are waiting beyond the six-week deadline for diagnostic tests, including cancer. It has become harder for young people from our poorest communities to get a place at university. And we have communities right across Scotland suffering from rising antisocial behaviour and violent crime. These are the important issues that the people of Scotland really care about. So why is it that the only folk getting any of the First Minister's attention aren't patients, they aren't students, they aren't victims of crime, but they're her own independent supporters? First Minister. Just because Ruth Davidson wishes that was the case, I'm afraid doesn't make it true. But Ruth Davidson knows that she's wrong eh, on access to higher education. The most up-to-date statistics on access to university shows there's been a 12% increase in 18-year-olds from our most deprived communities going to university. Of all ages, that increases 13%. The figures published this week show more care experienced young people uh, going into higher education. They show improved retention rates for young people from our deprived communities going to university. On the National uh, Health Service, we're putting more money into the National Health Service. This is in the week, of course, when Ruth Davidson admitted that the biggest risk to her health service uh, was the preference of the Tories for tax cuts over investment in our public services. And perhaps, presiding officer, this is a good moment to remind 
Ruth Davidson, that if we had taken her advice when we passed our budget for this financial year and given tax cuts to the rich instead of investing in our National Health Service, we'd have £500 million less to spend. That's equivalent to 12,000 nurses in our National Health Service. So we'll continue to invest while the Tories continue to do all the damage that at least Ruth Davidson has had the grace to admit to this week. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Thank you, your presiding officer. Radiology services in Scotland are in need of resuscitation. This matters because when radiology fails, the health service fails. We are now witnessing a national radiology service that is starting to crumble. Not my words, the words this week of Dr Grant Baxter, the head of the Royal College of Radiologists in Scotland. First Minister, is Dr Baxter wrong? First Minister. Uh, no, we will continue to work uh, with clinicians like Dr Baxter to address the challenges that our National Health Service is facing. If we look at uh, the statistics published this week in terms of diagnostic tests, there are eight diagnostic tests, four of them are in radiology, uh, and we're seeing their performance of over 90% in terms of meeting the target. Endoscopy tests, performance is not as good as that, which is why the Health Secretary has outlined further action uh, this week. Uh, we know that our NHS is facing uh, significant extra demand. Uh, we're seeing uh, the demand, for example, for outpatient uh, appointments up by 10% in the last uh, decade. This is not unique to Scotland. Uh, it's a challenge that health services across the world are facing. That is why we are taking action to invest more in our health service. Uh, we're investing record sums. We will invest an additional £2 billion over this parliament. And of course, the health secretary announced £50 million of additional funding uh, just this week to help tackle uh, waiting times. We're also taking steps to reform our health service, to shift the balance of care and of do more to recruit uh, into key specialties. So we will continue to take that action. It is action that is needed uh, and we are determined to continue to take it. Richard Leonard. But the action which is being taken isn't working. Dr Baxter goes on to say, waiting times continually increase, largely due to imaging backlogs. Cancers go undiagnosed. Patients cannot be treated as their scans are not reported on time. Patients' anxiety and worry over pending scan reports can last for weeks and months. These are real lives, First Minister. And it is the fear of having to wait for a cancer diagnosis, the anxiety and the trauma of a longer than necessary wait for treatment, the difference the difference between early and late diagnosis. The government has a target that patients should not wait longer than six weeks for these tests. Yet just two days ago, it was revealed that one in five patients is now waiting too long. So can Nicola Sturgeon tell the chamber what that figure was when she became first minister? As I have already said, there are challenges around diagnostic tests, but I would encourage uh, Richard Leonard to look at the detail of that. In terms of the four radiology tests, performance is above 90%. Uh, when it comes to scopes, uh, performance is not as good as we want it to be, which is why this week the Health Secretary has announced action that Bowel Cancer UK uh, has described as an important announcement that is a step in the right direction. We've also invested an additional £5 million to support access to diagnostics uh, for suspected cancer patients um, and uh, of course boards assure the Scottish Government that where somebody is suspected of having cancer they are treated with priority and within six weeks in fact the vast majority of cancer patients are seen within two to three weeks. Uh, the 62 uh, day standard uh, for cancer is an important one and once a decision has been made to treat the average uh, wait for cancer treatment is only six days so where there are issues uh, and we're very frank where those issues are the government will continue to take the action to address them uh, but the overall trend if you look at inpatient uh, and day case waiting times over the decade that the SNP uh, has been in government the numbers seen overall are up but the numbers waiting more than 12 weeks down by 30 percent the numbers waiting more than 18 weeks down by 43 
5%. So we will continue to invest and we will continue to carry out the reforms to how our health service delivers care that will mean that patients are treated in the way they deserve to be. Richard Leonard. Presiding officer, one in 13 patients waited too long when Nicola Sturgeon became first minister. Today, it is one in five. That's a 171% increase in patients waiting too long. Patients waiting for diagnostic tests and investigations, including for cancer. And that is what the people of Scotland want the First Minister to focus on. Not promoting another divisive referendum, not taking to Twitter to defend the decade of cuts and austerity that would come with leaving the UK. Presiding officer, there are serious problems in our National Health Service, Absolutely. and they are growing. Labour raises them in this Parliament week after week, Absolutely. but the SNP is expending more energy on its cuts commission than cutting NHS waiting times. Absolutely. When is the First Minister going to stop putting nationalism before the National Health Service? First Minister. Well, I think Richard Leonard has has just shown That's quite enough, please. colours. It is interesting, isn't it, presiding officer, that the only people to have mentioned independence in this chamber today are the Better Together parties, which I think speaks volumes. So this is the week in which the Health Secretary has announced extra action, action that has been welcomed by Bill Cancer at UK. Uh, it's the week in which the Health Secretary has announced the investment of an additional £50 million to tackling uh, waiting times. When we did similar last year, that had an impact on outpatient waiting times. So the recent statistics this week show improvement in outpatient waiting times. Uh, and we are obviously going to target this investment on inpatient waiting times. So we'll continue uh, to take the action on health, on education, across the whole range of issues that I've spoken about today. And we'll leave the Better Together parties to speak about whatever they want. Thank you. A number of uh, quite a lot of supplementary interests today. First of the constituency section from Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Would the First Minister agree with me that it's great news that the Stirling Clack City Region deal, heads of terms, was signed in Stirling this morning. The total package, package of 95.2 million includes an additional 5 million from the Scottish Government for infrastructure projects at Callan and, and, and Kildeen. But should you also agree with me that the UK Government have overpromised and underdelivered? Given that the Scottish Government will invest £50 million in real terms over 10 years, while the UK Government will only invest £40 million over 15 years uh, once the notional typical. £5 million valuation for the MOD for side is discounted. Yeah, yeah. First Minister. Well, firstly, I do think it's very welcome that the Stirling Click Manager uh, deal has been agreed today. It will be good for that area and credit to Bruce Crawford and others who've campaigned so hard for it. Uh, we were hoping to see a UK government investment of £50 million. That's what we were prepared to commit. That is what the Scottish Government has committed. So it is disappointing that the UK government has committed to significantly less than that. In fact, if you look at the Scottish Government's overall commitment to city growth deals now, it stands at 1.3 billion compared to just a billion for the UK government. So we'll continue to encourage the UK government to, to do more, uh, but we will not hold back in giving these cities and these regions the investment they deserve. Neil Bibby. The First Minister is aware of my constituent, Denzel Darku, who faces the prospect of deportation and huge uncertainty about his future. This is a young man who has built his life in Paisley, once a member of the Scottish Youth Parliament, a Commonwealth Games baton bearer, and a student nurse who wants to work in our NHS, but who is also the victim of bogus migration targets and the hostile environment policy of the Home Office. He is someone who has contributed a huge amount to this country and who wants to stay in Scotland and the UK so he can contribute even more. And given the reaction of so many people in my community and across the country, it's clear people want him to stay here too. Can I ask the First Minister to take the opportunity to make clear to the Home Office the impact their immigration policies are having on young people in Denzel's position? And does the First Minister agree with me that there can be no justification for driving a young man like Denzel away from the place he calls home? First Minister.
Order, please. First Minister. Presiding officer, I think the complete lack of support that the Tories have just shown for a young man uh, who ha has Scotland as his home and who wants to continue to have Scotland as his home says everything we need to know yeah. about the Conservative yeah. Party today. Shame on them. Uh, I uh, am aware of the case of Denzel Darkey. I've met uh, Denzel in the past. He is a fine young man. He is an absolute credit to Scotland. And it is outrageous, scandalous, a disgrace that he is threatened with deportation. Uh, we should be trying to attract more uh, young people of his calibre to Scotland, not chasing them away. He wants to be a nurse in our National Health Service. Yeah. How many times do the Tories stand up in this chamber and complain about matters in our National Health Service? How many times do they stand up and complain about staffing shortages in our health service? Uh, and yet we have the Tories wanting to deport a young man who wants to contribute to our National Health Service. And Ruth Davidson is saying, well, she said she didn't agree with the targets, but she wants Scotland to remain locked into these immigration targets that are so damaging to our economy and our society. Uh, the immigration policies of the Tories, I think, are disgraceful. Uh, I will do everything I can to make the case uh, for Denzel uh, Darku to argue uh, that case, as I'm sure Neil Bibby, as uh, the MSP who's taken up the case, uh, will do. But I think uh, what we need is more than action in one case. Uh, what we need is a change to immigration policy, a more humane policy, and one that recognises the needs of our country. And it's that that all of us should be campaigning and arguing for. Andy Whiteman. Yes. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister whether her government will bring forward legislation to enable the City of Edinburgh to become a normal European city by having the power to introduce a visitor levy or tax. First Minister. Uh, well, we will continue to consider uh, these issues in the context of our budget planning. I would encourage uh, the member to discuss this, as I'm sure he has in the past, with the uh, Finance uh, Secretary. It's not uh, currently a proposal that the Scottish Government is putting forward, but of course we'll continue to listen to representations made. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what additional support the Scottish Government might be able to provide to hard pressed police in Ayrshire following up to 2,000 young people arriving mostly by train at Troon on Bank Holiday Monday and causing alcohol related disturbances on the beach. First Minister. Well, firstly, it uh, is regrettable if young people behave in a way that causes antisocial behaviour or disturbance to local communities. Uh, the fantastic bank holiday uh, Monday that was enjoyed across Scotland uh, was a, a fantastic thing and many individuals and families took the time to enjoy that uh, in a thoroughly positive way. Of course, we're investing uh, in the police service uh, in this financial year. The resource budget of the police service is increasing in real terms. And of course, unlike the situation south of the border, we've maintained, uh, broadly speaking, police uh, numbers where I think uh, in England, we've seen uh, 20,000 uh, police officers uh, lost from the service. So we will continue to invest in our police service and continue to support them in the fantastic work that they do. Question number three, Willie Rennie. When Nicola Sturgeon announced a legally binding treatment time guarantee, she said there would be a straightforward system of redress on the rare occasions when things go wrong. It was rare that things went wrong at first. That is true. Only five patients waited longer than 12 weeks. It is not rare anymore. There are now 13,005 patients waiting now. The First Minister will recognise those words these are the exact words I used exactly one year ago when I questioned the First Minister. Not much has changed, except the number of patients waiting has gone up yet again. More people waiting for longer, letting down patients, letting down staff. A year ago, the First Minister promised me things would get better. Just when is that going to happen? First Minister. Well, firstly, the figures published this week are not good enough as far as uh, I am concerned, although when we look at the treatment time 
guarantee. Uh, since that was introduced, uh, 1.6 million patients have received the treatment within the required uh, time frame. Uh, but the figures are not good enough. In terms of outpatient waiting times, we've seen an improvement because of the investment and the work that's been undertaken. The additional investment uh, announced uh, this week will help us to drive further improvements around inpatient uh, waiting times. Uh, Willie Rennie raises a, a serious issue. Uh, we know that the NHS is facing uh, significantly increased demand. If we look uh, and compare now to 2007, we see 10% more new outpatient attendances a year. We see a 10% increase in inpatient attendances. That's why uh, we are doing the hard work to prepare our NHS for the future. We're investing record sums. Uh, the NHS budget is up by £4 billion already under this government and will go up by a further £2 billion. Uh, per head, NHS funding in Scotland is 8% higher than it is in England, and I've already spoken about the 50 million announced this week uh, for waiting times, but we're also taking the action, and Willie Rennie's called for much of this action, to shift the balance of care, uh, to do more in social care, to do more in community settings, to invest more in mental health. So we will continue to do the hard work. It's not only Scotland that is facing these challenges. Governments across the world are facing these challenges. That's why we have to do the hard work to make sure we're preparing our NHS for the future. And as I said earlier on, uh, when we look at the longer term trend over the past uh, 10 years, uh, the numbers waiting more than 12 weeks, the numbers waiting more than 18 weeks for inpatient and day case treatment are down significantly. Uh, but we do face challenges and that's why we're taking all of the action that I've already outlined today. Willie Rennie. The First Minister talks about extra money. It was announced this week, even though patients were crying out for it months ago. Whilst patients were waiting in pain and anxiety for treatment, the government was holding back the money until the newspaper headlines got too bad for the First Minister to bear. That money is to treat patients, not to cover for the government's failures in the NHS. Waiting times are the worst ever. The waiting time guarantee means nothing. Not failure after failure. And the First Minister has still not answered my question. Five people were waiting. Then 13,000 people were waiting. Now 16,000 people are waiting. It's supposed to be zero. It's the law, guaranteed. When is the First Minister going to obey her own law? First Minister. Firstly, Willie Rennie is wrong in what he says about NHS funding. The funding uh, given to NHS boards is increasing, but of course it makes sense that we have the ability, if NHS boards uh, face particular challenges, to have the funding to target those particular challenges. Uh, that uh, is a sensible way of proceeding and we will continue to take that action. And if you look at the £50 million that was invested uh, last year, particularly to deal with some of the challenges around outpatient waiting times, since last September we've seen a reduction of 23% in the numbers waiting uh, more than the target for outpatient consultations. Uh, of course, seeing more people in outpatients, of course, adds pressure to inpatient treatment, which is why uh, this funding now allows health boards to target uh, inpatient waiting time. So we will continue to do the hard work that is required. As I've said many times before in this chamber, the health services in countries across the UK and across the world are facing the challenges of an ageing population. That doesn't just mean the numbers uh, seeking treatment are going up, but the complexity uh, of cases is increasing as well. So the investment that we're putting in, plus the reform work we are doing, uh, is all about making sure that the NHS is supported during a difficult period of transition, and we will continue to get on with that work. Some further supplementaries. The first from Maurice Coley. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> Does the First Minister share my concerns for the safety of communities following the release of Audit Scotland's recent report into the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, which found serious concerns about the cost of maintaining the service's vehicles, equipment and properties, and warned of an increased risk of fire engines breaking down? And will the Government be following the Audit Scotland's call for an annual investment of £80.4 so that the service's assets can be brought up to satisfactory standards? First Minister. Well, firstly, I, I do think it's important not to be irresponsible in characterising the Audit Scotland report this morning. Overall, it's an extremely positive uh, report about the progress being made uh, by the Scottish uh, Fire and Rescue Service. In terms of the... 
In terms of the figure around the capital backlog, um, I think it's important to say that that includes uh, some expenditure that is certainly desirable but not essential. And this point is particularly important. Fire service assets must comply with stringent safety requirements. There is no suggestion whatsoever that equipment is unsafe. Of course, in the budget for this year, the Scottish Government increased the spending capacity of the Scottish Fire Service by £15.5 million. In the last financial year, we increased capital funding by almost £22 million and maintained that increase in this year's budget. And since the single fire service was launched in 2014, the fire service itself has invested over £94 million in property, vehicle fleet and other assets. So we will continue to support the fire service to make those investments, continue to ensure that it has the funding it needs. And again, as I said in response to Ruth Davidson, we should remember that if we had followed the Conservatives' recommendations on our budget for this year, we would have 500 million pounds less to spend. The Tories cannot continually argue for tax cuts that would reduce our spending power and then come to this chamber and ask us to spend more on every single area of our responsibility. It's not credible and it's why the Tories are not and probably never will be credible either. Joanne Lamond. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister has set a target that 16% of those starting the first full-time degree by 2021 will be from the 20% most deprived areas in Scotland. Given that the Scottish Funding Council figures released yesterday, and I know that the First Minister won't dispute these figures, show that for the period 2015-16 to 2016-17, participation fell by 0.2% across Scotland, with individual institutions showing a bigger fall. What action will the First Minister take to understand why progress appears to be stalling? And will she consider reviewing the targets to include young people, like a constituent of mine, who's from a very low-income family, but does not live within the most deprived areas, and as a consequence, does not benefit from current Scottish Government action? First Minister. Well, I don't dispute the figures, but it is important to understand the figures. And and well, I hope people will listen to this because it's important. As Joanne Lamont rightly said, these are figures for 2016-17. They predate the Widening Access Commission recommendations. Uh, they justify the decision to set up the Widening yep. Access Commission. Uh, but the reason why it is wrong to look just at these figures is that we have more up-to-date figures. We have the UCAS figures for 2017-18. Now, uh, just to be clear, 2017-18 comes after 2016-17, and the 20, but this is serious, the 20, the 2017-18 figures show this, and UCAS themselves uh, have described this as an increase. Uh, there's an increase of 12% amongst 18-year-olds from our most deprived communities going to Scottish universities uh, and an increase of 13% when we look at all ages from our most deprived communities going to universities. So that is progress. It's not enough progress. Uh, that's why we've set the targets that Joanne Lamont uh, mentioned. But it is progress. And I think for members and the opposition parties to try to contort the figures to suggest that it's not progress, I think is a bit, is a bit rich. Now... Joanne Lamont raises, sorry, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to seriously answer this question. Joanne Ra Lamont raises a serious issue about how we measure deprivation. The commissioning on widening accesses report was very clear on the value of SIMD as a measure of deprivation and it recommended that we continue to use that uh, for tracking uh, and monitoring targets on fair access. Uh, but we do recognise the limitations of uh, the Scottish Index of Multiple uh, Deprivation uh, and why we're open to ways in which other measures can be used. And uh, somebody from a sedentary position uh, has shouted, why are we not doing anything about it? Well, we established a working group to look exactly at that question, uh, how we refine the measurement to deal with some of the concerns that have been raised. So we are making progress in this area. And given the very legitimate concerns that have been raised by people across the chamber uh, and further afield, I would have thought that even although uh, people can rightly say we need to see further progress, people would welcome the progress that's already being made. Question number four, Christine Graham. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on suggestions by the RBS Chief Executive that post offices are the quote's, best solution close quotes, to replace local banks that have closed. First Minister. Well, communities across Scotland stand to be adversely affected by the ongoing programme of bank branch closures. Uh, there is no and there cannot be a one-size-fits-all solution to maintaining access to banking services in affected areas. Post offices provide many essential services, including basic banking transactions, and are a lifeline for many communities, but there are significant limitations on the range of services that they're able to offer, particularly for small businesses. Uh, many customers also remain concerned over levels of privacy available in post office premises. So I would encourage banks, including the Royal Bank of Scotland, to listen to the needs and concerns of their customers and ensure that practical solutions are put in place to allow all communities in Scotland to access essential banking services. Christine Graham. I thank the First Minister for her answer. It shouldn't be news to Ross McEwen, MD of RBS, but post offices have closed right, left and centre in my constituency in places like Erlston, Innerleith and Newton Grange, and RBS closes its branch in Pennycook next month. So does the First Minister agree with me that the comment by him that RBS piggyback on post offices was not only insulting but ill-informed? And does she agree with me, heading a company with 72% public ownership, he should get out and about, starting with my invitation to him to come round Midlothian, South Tweeddale and Lauderdale to chat with my constituents and small businesses to see what they think of his closures and his grand solution? Yeah, First Minister. I'm sure. I'm sure most people would be delighted to accept Christine Graham's invitation to uh, visit her beautiful uh, constituency. Um, I do recognise and share many of the concerns that Christine uh, Graham has expressed. This is an issue I've discussed personally uh, over recent times with RBS. I'm meeting the chair of RBS uh, later this afternoon and uh, no doubt this is a an issue that we will discuss uh, then as well. We do recognise the importance of post offices to local communities, uh, but we've made uh, clear uh, to both the UK Government and Post Office Limited that they have a responsibility to ensure that existing services are maintained rather than reduced. We also continue to fund Citizens Advice Scotland, uh, research into post office outreach services. Uh, so they have a role to play, but I do share uh, Christine Graham's view that they cannot necessarily provide all of the services locally uh, that people want to see. So I would say to all banks, including RBS, that they have an obligation to listen uh, and to address the concerns that their customers have on their ability to access those services in Christine Graham's constituency and indeed in other constituencies across the country. Question number five, Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what action she is taking to tackle human trafficking in Scotland. First Minister. Uh, well, the long-term increase in recorded uh, sexual crime, uh, both in Scotland and in the rest of the UK, is due to a range of factors, including victims having more confidence to come forward uh, to report uh, to police what has happened uh, to them. Uh, we will shortly be publishing the first annual progress report on implementation of our trafficking and exploitation strategy. Uh, that report will set out the wide range of action taken since publication of the strategy last May. Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you. This week we heard again from the very Reverend Dr. John Chalmers how Roma children and young women in Govan Hill are being sold in sex slavery by gangsters, while others live eight to ten to a room working 12-hour days for a pittance in return. Obviously you did publish your strategy in tra on traffic and exploitation a year ago. Could you give us some highlights of an assessment of how this strategy is working in practice and if it is achieving everything it is aimed to and how we how can, uh, sorry, and when we can hope to put an end to this human tragedy? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, I am obviously very well aware of concerns that are raised about Govan Hill. It's an issue I speak to the police uh, regularly about. Uh, and my message, firstly, is people should come forward and report to the police uh, any concerns that they have. I know that the police rigorously investigate and have investigated all concerns that have come uh, forward to them. Um, more generally, in, in terms of the strategy, as I said in my original answer, we will shortly be publishing the first annual progress report on implementation of the strategy, which will set out the range of actions that have been taken uh, since publication and uh, will also look at the further action that requires uh, to be taken. But the areas we've been focusing on, for example, uh, working to raise awareness and strengthen the protection uh, for victims of uh, 
trafficking. We've also increased funding for victims of trafficking. Uh, the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Act, which was passed by this Parliament in 2015, strengthens the legal protections uh, and the police powers that are available uh, to tackle this. So we will continue to take those actions. Uh, I think the member described it as a human tragedy. Any individual who is trafficked uh, or subject uh, to exploitation in this way it is a human tragedy. We must treat it as such and the Scottish Government will continue to do so extremely seriously. Question number six, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will call an independence referendum before the end of the current parliamentary session in light of the report by the Sustainable Growth Commission. First Minister. First Minister. My goodness, the opposition parties just hate talking about independence, don't they? <laughs> As I've said before, uh, when we have uh, greater clarity on the Brexit uh, outcome, I will set out uh, my views on the best way uh, forward for Scotland. Uh, I welcome the report of the Sustainable Growth Commission. Crucially, it allows us to focus on how we can build a better, more prosperous and fairer country instead of just managing the consequences of Tory austerity and the decline of Brexit, which I know is Labour's preference, but it's certainly not mine. Jackie Bailey. I know just how much the First Minister likes talking about independence. It's fair to say, though, that the Growth Commission report has caused deep splits in the SNP. Oh, yes. Alex Bell. <laughs> Presiding officer, they clearly, they clearly don't like hearing this, so I'll wait till they're ready. OK. Alex Bell, who helped to write the SNP's independence white paper, says that the Commission report will mean spending cuts and no economic freedom. Kenny McCaskill, former SNP Justice Secretary, says the acceptance of so many aspects of neoliberal doctrine in the report are a step too far. Given, given that all of the candidates for the SNP deputy leadership have said that they expect a referendum within this term of Parliament, with Keith Brown even telling us that it could be 12 months away, let me ask the First Minister, if the Growth Commission report is a device for bringing forward the referendum, or is it a vehicle to convince her party members to delay? First Minister. Well, I've got some analysis here that I'm going to, I'm going to share with the Chamber, and hopefully it will be of in, it'll be of embarrassment to the Tories, hopefully it'll be of interest uh, to Labour. If the spending recommendations uh, of the Growth Commission had been applied over the past 10 years, the 2.6 billion real terms cuts imposed on the budget of the Scottish Government by Tory governments at Westminster would have been completely wiped out. It would have eradicated austerity uh, in Scotland. That, that is the reality. So the, the Growth Commission report is welcome. It allows us to focus on how to build a better Scotland. It shows that even if independence doesn't lead to faster growth, the deficit created by Westminster can be turned around without austerity. The report is explicit in its rejection of austerity, explicit in its recommendation for real terms spending growth. And as I've said, if that approach had been taken, we wouldn't have had to put up with the cuts we have done over the past 10 years. But you know, the really important bit of the report is that it sets out how the powers of independence can enable us to make our economy even more successful and match the success of other small countries. Powers to grow our population, powers to close the gender pay gap, powers to tailor our economic policies to our needs, not the needs of London and the south-east of England. So I know, I know Labour's preference is just to leave us with Tory rule, austerity and the decline of Brexit. Well, I'll leave Labour to argue that with the Tories. I'm going to argue for a better alternative. Question number seven. Alec Neal. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I've got a question of my own. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will take urgent action to ensure that appropriate life-saving drugs 
are made available to people with cystic fibrosis. First Minister. The Scottish Government and NHS officials will be meeting the pharmaceutical company Vertex next month to continue to encourage them to make a fresh SMC submission uh, for the drug or Cambi. Uh, the Health Secretary has continued to strongly encourage the manufacturer to bring forward that submission as quickly as possible at a fair price. Uh, in addition, I know Alec Neil will be aware, because I think this is what kicked off when he was Health Secretary, a new process known as uh, PAX Tier 2 goes live across Scotland from tomorrow. Uh, that provides clinicians with the ability to make requests to the local health board for medicines not yet approved by the SMC on an individual patient basis. Alec Neil. Officer, can I thank the First Minister for that question, for that answer, and uh, can I particularly welcome the fact that from tomorrow, CF patients will be able to submit a, a patient request, individual patient request, for the new drug or Cambi. But can I express to the First Minister there is concern still, as expressed by Professor Gordon McGregor in the Daily Record on Monday, about the lack of the general availability of our Cambi. Can I therefore ask the First Minister if, in order to make or can be generally available without having to go through an individual request, which of course is not always successful, will the First Minister do all she can to ensure that this happens, including, if necessary, in reinvesting the rebates money from the Pharmaceutical Price Regulation Scheme, PPRS, as done on a previous occasion to ensure CF patients get the life-saving drugs uh, like Kyla Daco in the past, that they need? First question. Um, yes, I do uh, agree with, with all of that. Uh, as Alec Neil is right to say, Ocambi is not currently routinely available in the NHS anywhere in the UK, although it is, I, I understand, in the Republic of Ireland. As I said uh, in my opening answer, uh, Government officials, NHS officials will meet with the pharmaceutical company next month. We want them to bring forward a submission as quickly as possible at a fair price. Um, in terms of the uh, question about the PPRS, yes, we will continue to ensure uh, that any rebate from the PPRS is invested in new medicines, as uh, we've done in the past. Negotiations are about to start uh, again, uh, but of course it's the UK government that leads uh, these negotiations with UK pharmaceutical uh, companies. Uh, and lastly, we will continue to implement the reforms that I've spoken about previously in this chamber, of which the PACS Tier 2 uh, initiative is uh, one of, and we have seen significantly increased access uh, to new medicines due to these uh, reforms in recent years. So we will continue with the reforms, we will continue to ensure that any rebate is invested, and we will encourage pharmaceutical companies to bring forward new medicines at fair prices so that people across Scotland who need these medicines can have best access to them. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We'll move on to members' business in the name of Miles Briggs shortly on improving Edinburgh City's bypass, but I'm just going to have a short suspension for a few moments to allow the gallery to clear, or those who in the gallery wish to leave, and our new guests to arrive. Short suspension. <laughs>